Welcome to our act of worship here in the benefice of St Aldhelm on today the 12th of July and we're now going to continue with our bells. Pauline and Michael in conversation 
with Liz. So this morning we're really very pleased to be introducing Liz Ho to you and asking her some questions. For those of you who don't know her very well, Liz is one of the church wardens at St. Nicholas Worth Matravers. So Liz, I'm looking for you, she's moved on my screen. So Liz, how long have you been at Worth and, um, and why Worth? Um, well, we've, we've lived in Worth uh, 25, no, we bought our cottage 25 years ago and we will have lived here 22 years on the 1st of August. Um, I think in a funny way, um, the cottage chose us really because um, like all um, so many people, we'd had our holidays here and we stayed oh, over 10 years, I think, in Worth and Travels and we absolutely loved it. But then, of course, you know, our children grew up um, and um, the eldest two weren't living at home. Toby was about 17, I think. and. Um, we had a small, um, well, we used to have bed and breakfast, Tim and I. We used to sort of get, have breaks at the tea shop across the road. And, um, but sailing has always been a big part of Tim's life. And we had this small sailing boat, which we kept at Shell Bay, um, which we used, which we camped on. I mean, basically it was, sailing was became like an overnight exercise disguised as a holiday um, and then when after we had um, a dinghy um, uh, broke away from the boat and we were marooned on the boat at Shelburne um, uh, this dinghy was eventually found down at uh, Hearst Castle actually so we had to pick it up and have it mended and um, we came down to collect it and we'd arranged to stay at the tea shop opposite and um, when we came around the corner, this cottage was for sale. And I mean, we were both, I was uh, teaching PE uh, three, four days a week and Tim obviously was busy with business. And um, so, but we looked at it and it was a January day and it was pouring with rain and it was freezing cold. And even then the garden was, <laughs> was overgrown and I, the cottage is just a lot more fully down than it is today, and but I loved it. Um, and I'm not sure about Tim; he wasn't sort of totally not quite so enamoured. <laughs> not quite so enamoured. <laughs> Thinking about all the work he'd have to exactly. do. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then we bought it. We bought it, um, and uh, you know, Tim. He says we both say it's the best thing we ever did. So, it's called Cobbler's Cottage, isn't it? Yes. And that, Why is it called Cobbler's Cottage, well, do you know? That, that is extraordinary because um, Tim's family business that goes back over a hundred years was a, um, a, a shoe. He, he worked in shoes all his life. And this was the Cobbler's, the shoemaker's cottage. So, uh, so here we are. Yeah, okay. Well, what about St. Nicholas Church then? How did you get drawn into the fellowship there? And, and tell everybody what you do there, but you've only got 10 minutes. No, you haven't got, you haven't got that long. <laughs> um, it was, it's extraordinary. I mean, the welcome at, at St. Nicholas was amazing, but I'd been brought up, um, I grew up as a child in Kent, in a very small village um, with a church that was called St. Nicholas, and it was a Norman church. Um, and of course it was lovely when we came here and we had a tremendous welcome by everybody um, who, um, and really it was, it was like coming home, but then, oh. um, but, uh, and what do I do? I think what I try and do is share that Christian care that was shown to us and, oh, sorry, shown to all of us when we came here. Um, you know, by such lovely people as Brenda Nunn and Marion Holloway, and I hope that, you know, I, mm. I, can, I still continue to do that. But you don't only look after, um, or, you know, get involved with St Nicholas Church, do you? You also have to tromp along the path to oh, uh, yes. the chapel. I do chapel, yeah, I love the chapel. I don't think my car does, and the guy who repairs it just yeah. doesn't like it either, but... Um, the chapel is beautiful and such a special place and um and i think you know to have you know 
to have that privilege to care for it. Um, well, you're a very hard-working church warden, Liz, and we're all very lucky to have you. So, turning to the question we ask most people, how have you and Tim managed with the lockdown arrangements? Well, I know you've, you've been at home isolating, haven't you both? Yes, so. I had to shield, not because I'm ill or anything, but I mm. take my med medication, which is cocktailed with my age, put me into the shielding <laughs> list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here I've been for 16 weeks, but, um, you, you know, it's what a lovely place to live in. And we were very lucky because we have lots of space, so therefore we've been able to walk. Um, mm -hmm. And in the garden, we've lived, I've lived outside, we both lived outside. I mean, it has, and the weather's been amazing. So, mm -hmm. and lots of lovely friends around. And incredible deliveries from Swanage. I mean, that's what we've had. And lovely friends, you know, who've helped us out. Anyone who's seen your garden will know it's it's truly beautiful. So the fact that you've had extra time to be in your garden, it must be absolutely magnificent at the moment. Well, I don't think it's my limbs, but it's a bit, been a very special time. <laughs> it's a very, very lovely garden. So any positive thoughts or experiences then to share from, from the pandemic situation? Uh, Shielding was a, was a terrible blow because as a mm. church warden, I thought I should be helping everybody, you, you know, and it did make, and it's made me feel guilty, but, um, you, you know, because of so many people that needed help during, during that time. Mm. But um, I think it's with walking and gardening, it makes you, it's made me, you know, be still and, and to think that's, you know, what does God, you know, want for you and also to, and to pray more mm. you know, I mean mm. you know we we haven't got the answers but we can pray and we can pray for help yeah oh well, thank you Liz Liz hasn't mentioned another very very important thing she does she's custodian of the ducks in Worth as well aren't you well they're our neighbours actually they live over yes the they live next door <laughs> yes <laughs> And she sees them to bed every evening and um, well, rarely, you rarely go away, do you? Because you, you've got the ducks and to look after. Well, it's such a lovely place to live in. So we're very anyway. happy. We're very well, happy. thank you for all you do, Liz, and, um, and you and Tim. Thank you very much.
So together we say the words of preparation as we come before God to continue in our worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you now and forever. Amen. Words of the Collect. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer, which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry, they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name. Through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another 30. So may I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Probably the most important section of 13th chapter of Matthew is the one that we didn't read. We skipped to get to the, as it were, explanation of the parable, verses 10 to 17. And there the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak to them, the crowds, in parables? Even there, we're left puzzling the what. The parables are about kingdom, God's kingdom. Inevitably, the word kingdom means we start thinking most of the time of things like power and defense, defense capability, perhaps. Uh, Laws, law and order, crime and justice, all those sort of things. Jesus clearly wants us to think differently. And I think I find it, and I 
for it maybe for you, really hard for the word kingdom to mean God's meaning rather than our own. There is indeed an urgency about the kingdom. You can't ignore it. The parables Jesus tells are summoning us to, resp to respond. However, almost as alongside that, almost as part of it, God gives us space, not least because he tells us about the kingdom in parables and several of them, some very short, some like this one, longer, some with a little more in, uh, interpretation from Jesus himself or um, furthered perhaps following reflection by the first Christian. Um, so, and also several parables, Jesus isn't saying this one tells you the whole truth uh, or it's this one, but together the message is there for us, perhaps speaking to our, God speaking to each of us in our own condition. So, you need space for the parables, space to think about them, space to reflect upon them. And uh, I found myself doing that through the past week. And if God himself gives us such space, relates to us in that way, we are to be likewise to relate in this, a similar way to each other, to give each other such space, such freedom. And perhaps that's one of the most valuable things we can do. Perhaps it's one of the hardest things for us. But we have a longing for people to know God, to know him more, and to find things out about him. Yes, some we, so we're to give people space. Yes, depending on how well we know them, on the circumstances, what is appropriate, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we can give a word of encouragement, a suggestion, a prompt even. I rang someone the other day um, to seemingly do that, and actually the phone call ended up with them encouraging me. Um, so, and space isn't always, we need to always think of space in terms of length. It's more about a quality giving us the scope to make our own response. If we are able to let God speak to us through the parables of Jesus, what do we begin to see? And not so much the picture I began to paint earlier. Law, order, defense, power, all those sorts of words. Rather, the way Jesus spoke, the way he lived, the way service, self-giving love, seeking to make clear God's truth. There have been many conversations in, in the recent months along the following lines, how fortunate we are living here, thinking, think of what it must be like living in, often it's been a tower block, people have said. I find myself thinking of People perhaps on a large housing estate with not much of a view. We'll all have places that sort of we think, gosh, that would be a hard place perhaps for us uh, to live. And we've had here, this part of the world, for most of us, we hope, it won't have been true of everybody, we've had considerable space in these recent months. Yes with anxiety and concerns, perhaps in, in particular early on when we wondered how things would be and now when we're wondering how they're going to be. And when we've heard news from elsewhere, the um, key workers having a very, very challenging time, not perhaps much space for them there, people ill, people dying. By and large, has been a quality of space and quietness. Now, it seems to me, 
we're being called to share this space as we are each summer. And if we're honest, most of us grumble a bit because it can take longer to get out your drive and uh, to walk along the pavement and uh, so on and so on and so forth. But I reckon uh, this year in particular, um, we're called to share this, to do so willingly, generously, graciously um, with people who are now able to leave their homes, however they might be. And it might not be the physical circumstances, it might be others uh, as well. And they're free to leave home, to travel and to have a holiday. But this, it seems to me, reminds us of our calling as God's people who gather now in a variety of ways, uh, our calling to um, so live together, to so worship, to so witness. There is space for people to respond and to join in the life of God's people. And I think um, in all the um, interviews we've had at the beginning of our services, we've been reminded of how important that has been for people who've become part of the various fellowships. So I think we can uh, take heart from that, uh, but a reminder as we attend to Jesus's parables that our lives, our life as his people, as the church, needs to reflect that. Of all, giving people space, sharing when that's appropriate, perhaps for some, telling stories. And of course, we can all ponder and discuss what is the key message of a parable. Certainly a pretty clear message of this parable is that whatever the hindrances there are, um, God is not thwarted by them. And there is a harvest and actually, indeed, an abundant harvest. Amen. sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. 
let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. We say together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Though so Jesus was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made him nothing. Taking the form of the slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself to be the even the dead of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name. That's at the name of Jesus, every knee can and every proclaim that Jesus is Lord. The, the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, you know we are often filled with fear and foreboding. Give us courage, deepen our trust, and grant us a quiet mind in these troubled and turbulent times. We pray particularly at this time for our parliament, our scientists and all in authority for wisdom, that they may be guided by your example and seek the common good. Lord God, we ask you please to bless those who have stayed indoors, for they have protected us. Bless the unemployed and the self-employed, for their need of God is great. Help us to find the compassion and means to continue supporting the food bank and charities who support them. Bless the shopkeepers and the checkout workers who have endeavoured to keep our supplies of food at this difficult time and have had the patience and fortitude in the face of overwork and frustration. Bless the delivery drivers and the postal workers. Bless the refuse collectors. Bless the teachers, for they remain constant and steadfast in these disturbing times, caring for our children's education and well-being, 
at risk to themselves. Bless the church workers, church wardens, deacons, priests and bishops, for they are a comforting presence in a hurting world as they continue to signpost towards God. We pray today for our bishops, Nick and Karen, and our own clergy, Ian, James and Nick. Bless the single parent, for they are coping alone with their responsibilities, <clears throat> and for them there is no respite. Bless those who are isolated with their abusers. We pray the day will come soon when they will feel safe and free from harm. Bless those who live alone, for they are children of God, and with him they will never be lonely. Bless the hospital workers, the ambulance crews, the doctors, the nurses, the care assistants and the cleaners, for they stand between us and the grave and the kingdom of heaven is surely theirs. We pray today for all our local hospitals and GP practices and all the staff who work there so tirelessly to help us. Give them courage to face the challenges they are under and peace and rest at the end of their shifts. We pray for all the scientists who are searching tirelessly for treatments and cures for COVID-19 and ask that your Holy Spirit come alongside them and inspire them in their quest. We remember those in our community and those known personally to us who are sick in body, mind or spirit thinking particularly of Jane, Rosemary, David, Trevor, Elizabeth, William, Kiff and Les. Bless the bereaved for whom the worst has already happened. They shall be comforted. And we pray today for the friends and family of those who have died recently thinking particularly of Brian and Philip. Lord, be alongside their friends and family, bring them comfort and ease their grief. Bless all who at this time have a pure heart, all who still hunger and thirst for justice, an end to racism, and all who work for peace and who model mercy. We live in a beautiful world, Lord, Help us to remember that we are all stewards of it and as we approach a new normal that we find better ways to care for it than we have done before and that nature finds a way to heal itself just as we pray we will too. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we say together, gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily, daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And, and do, do not, not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Alleluia. Christ is our peace, the indestructible peace we now share with each other. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I'll follow your lead as we offer one another a sign of the peace.
wonderful. We now have our hymn. So we come to our blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.